My name is Heidi Greenspan, and I'm um, head of a medical image processing lab. It's a deep learning lab at Tel Aviv University, and I'm also a co-founder and chief scientist of Redlogix. Redlogix is a small startup um, in the domain of uh, tools for radiologists and incorporating those tools in the regular workflow of the radiologists. And in this um, and in this work here on COVID. Um, we are um, actually a joint effort of engineering um, from Redlogix, as well as several universities uh, and medical centers. And um, uh, I want to thank all my collaborators. Uh, and I'd like to share this particular work here. You also mentioned we had an ISBI session. So in, in April, we had an ISBI session that was on COVID as well. But let me now um, uh, focus on, um, on this particular work that uh, um, I showed a little bit of it there and we'll show some here as well. Um, so our story begins with um, um, a system of uh, red logics that was deployed or is deployed in China, in fact. And um, this system uh, in, is a, a cloud-based system, and you see the viewer uh, on the left, uh, the reporting uh, um, part of the radiologist's workspace in the center, and on the right is actually um, the way that the AI um, tools uh, were, are introduced to the radiologist. And this is one particular implementation that was uh, done in China. And these tools that um, we support uh, as I mentioned, um, detect a variety of things in, uh, in the different scans that the radiologist sees uh, and report the findings with these key images that you see here and different measurements um, for each of these findings. So there is a chest CT package that contains several findings, including a nodule detector. And um, somewhere in uh, late January, early February, we started to notice that the system was processing many more chest CT cases than we had um, seen before, and that our nodule detectors were detecting um, ground glass opacities uh, a little bit larger than we were seeing before and for different age groups of population and so on. So uh, we immediately understood that there was something different going on. Um, and this um, was then confirmed by our colleagues um, the radiologists that were starting to publish um, their understanding of the various findings of the COVID um, pandemic. And um, one of them here, uh, early on publications by Adam Bernheim from Mount Sinai, um, basically um, introduced the fact that uh, a lot of these findings were manifested as ground glass opacities. Uh, here we have a different uh, publication that came out recently showing uh, um, a subtle case of a patient, again, with very um, subtle ground glass opacities. Uh, and here, in this case, we see much more um, evident, uh, somewhat fused, um, diffused uh, opacities. And um, since then, of course, the radiologists are looking for the various um, symptoms and categorizing um, stages of the disease and so on and so forth. So um, we um, saw that the tools we had, specifically the nodule detection tool, uh, was able to find the smaller ground glass opacities and we decided to see if we can quickly um, build the additional tools to uh, get all the uh, ground glass um, appearances uh, within the images. And the goal was to see, of course, if AI and imaging can support the um, diagnosis, the um, quantization of the disease, um, the backing of the disease over time, and many of the things that were already presented here and discussed today. So um, of course, some of the challenges in the field, again, uh, well known to all of us, uh, include the fact that um, we have very limited data. Um, we have, um, for, for that, we can do different techniques that we're familiar with, like director transfer techniques, uh, augmentation techniques, and so on. 
Um, it was also mentioned here before me that uh, we have very limited expert time these days. Um, so, of course, our experts are very busy. Um, so we have to use our other techniques like learning from multi-labels or weak learning. And what we want to see is if we could come up with a solution that is robust enough, even though we have all of these challenges in our hands, in order to really make a difference, we have to be robust to um, the different populations worldwide. And um, some of the tricks we, um, we're looking at um, were developing something rapidly based on uh, existing networks, existing technology. Uh, that technology can come from different modalities or from different tasks that we've done before. Um, so it really trying to push the limit on transferring and um, augmenting the data that we do have. The basic um, system solution that we are currently still working on uh, is uh, shown in the diagram here. The first, uh, it's comp comprised of two paths. There's a 3D path in which um, we use a nodule detector that I've mentioned before. Uh, it's a 3D system that uh, has been working for several years. It's quite robust and that, um, we saw could handle the small, uh, very small um, ground glass uh, focal opacities. Mm -hmm. Then um, in order to detect the larger opacities, we had to build uh, an additional layer or additional network uh, from scratch. So uh, for that, we decided to go for 2D analysis um, and I'll go more in depth into this path So what we see here are several components of this 2D uh, solution. First of all, uh, we need to segment out the lung uh, as a region of interest. And here, in order to do that, um, again, this is a consistent step in most of the work that we see here today, um, we are using a unit, but it's a pre-trained uh, encoder unit. Um, I'll show you in the next slide a sketch of this particular solution. This um, solution that uses a VGG16 encoder, um, we introduced in MICAI 2018. Um, and and um, we see here is an input image and output mass that we can extract automatically. Uh, and in, the, in that conference of MICAI 2018, we um, showed that it performs very, very well as compared to many of the other varieties of uh, networks that we can use uh, on this challenge of uh, anatomic structure segmentation that uh, is a well-known challenge. So um, this unit uh, that is pre-trained is our first component to extract in a very robust way the lungs and find the region of interest. Now, once we have that, we need to classify. And for that, we use the um, a ResNet 50 uh, network. It's uh, also pre-trained, um, sorry. And um, it's a basically, it's a basic uh, 2D slice by slice decision, yes or no um, classification of COVID or non-COVID. Okay, so for that, um, there are two things that we're using here that support the analysis in this very limited data scenario. One is we're doing this in 2D. So we have, uh, it's not case by case, but it's all the slices. Um, and we have weak annotations for these slices. So we only have uh, yes or no per slice. But we notice that what we want to extract is the decision as well as a localization map. So um, for the um, localization, we actually use um, the, a multi-scale GradCom solution by uh, fusing multi, multiple scale um, activation maps. And with this um, solution that we're proposing here, we can achieve fine grain segmentation. And we achieve this fine grain segmentation using only um, slice-based annotations. So again, we have a, somewhat of a trick here 
that we can uh, save on the annotations, save on our data and extract very nice um, output segmentation maps, which you see here. Um, for, each, for each slice, we have its corresponding uh, fine grain heat map. In terms of the classification, um, so for this uh, 2D classification task, we have very high sensitivity and specificity. You see here two different operating points. Um, and um, so, so we are, it's, a, it's a very uh, robust classification um, solution. Now, 2D um, is just a way for us to, to proceed to the full 3D case. And what you're seeing here is a, is a 3D case um, visualization, where in green, we have the solution uh, for the um, more focal opacities, the, the, the ones that we achieve from a long nodule detector. And then uh, in red, you see um, the areas of opacity for uh, larger diffuse cases. So um, we have this ability now to take a case and present this, uh, this map. Um, as was mentioned here in several of the talks, in many cases, when, uh, when the um, decision is to use the CT as a, as, a, as a key tool in the understanding of the disease or, or the tracking of the patient, um, several time points are taken. And this leads us to um, suggest that we can use um, the quantification that comes with our automatic detection to um, monitor the patient over time. Uh, for this, we, we came up with a score. We call it a corona score. It's a volumetric measurement of the opacity burden. Okay, so once we have um, the segmentation maps, we can extract from those um, the, um, for each slice where the activation is above a certain threshold. This threshold is defined with the use of uh, experts. And then um, we, we basically um, can extract and, and define this measure. We can see it here, I believe. So we have, um, we sum up the uh, activation, the positively detect, positive detected slices, but only looking at the ones that um, their activation is above a predefined threshold and get out um, a volumetric measure. That is uh, the summation as defined here. Now with this measure, we can now um, basically quantify a status of a patient in a certain time point. Uh, we see here three different time points for a particular patient, um, and we have the relative, we have the scores um, on the top. We can also provide a relative score. So we will start with a one and then um, see the, the um, relative uh, uh, process of the disease for that patient. Um, so what we see here are 18 different patients that we, uh, are, we can now view in, in these plots. On the left, you see the corona score for each patient over time. Um, this can give us a relative um, um, severity um, of the extent of the disease per patient. So on top are the um, larger extent and um, larger, um, more severe situation of, uh, of, of the lung volume and versus uh, the patients here on the bottom. So this gives us a relative uh, understanding of, uh, of the severity of the disease in terms of its extent. On the right, we see a plot that um, uses the normalized score. So every patient will start at one, and then we can see how that patient um, basically what, what the course of the disease is for that patient. In some, some cases, we see that um, the first uh, few, few time points um, situation um, deteriorates and becomes more severe. And only after a while, it starts decreasing and we can see recovery. And in other cases, we see a, a quicker trend toward recovery. So these kind of plots, uh, we believe, uh, and have received some uh, feedback from different radiologists around the world, um, may have a potential to support the understanding uh, of a certain patient cohort and um, basically also in the future enable us to predict um, 
the course of the disease per patient over time, and of course, then help us um, support possible treatment options and so on, and, and uh, management of patients in the hospital and so on and so forth. So um, some, um, some results uh, using the corona score. So um, we see a very, uh, uh, an area under curve score of 0.9, almost 0.95 for um, actual detection of this disease uh, for a cohort of 100, more than 100 patients with confirmed COVID versus almost 100 non-COVID uh, patient. And um, we can also try to start looking at our measure um, and compare it to radiologist um, severity scoring. And here you see some of the population that is severe versus non-severe. And with our score, we see that um, we have a, a nice distinction here between the two groups uh, with our uh, measure, with the corona measure. Similar kind of ideas we are um, now exploring or already developing for x-ray. So um, this was all for CT, but the same ideas we can do for x-ray. Um, as people mentioned, there are areas in the world where um, x-ray is more um, the, is, is, is a more common um, imaging that will be used or is currently used for patient um, diagnosis and treatment support. Um, so we are also developing, uh, we have a, a lung segmentation for um, the x-ray. We're able to detect uh, per x-ray uh, very high rates of detection of um, COVID versus, or, or, or inflammation, COVID-like inflammation versus not. And we can see, um, um, the ability to also come up with a score, which is the relative area score in this case, and again, track uh, um, the performance or the process of the disease per patient over time. So um, some, let me um, start with um, some concluding thoughts. Um, our goal was to see if AI and imaging can support, and we believe, as we've seen in many of our, in the previous presentations, that we can, in fact, develop uh, very strong tools. Um, the interesting thing here is that we are all talking about a very short time period of a few months, uh, and we were able to develop these tools very, very rapidly. Um, and I think that shows the strength, actually, and the potential of using AI models. Uh, today it's for COVID-19, and then as we learn how to use them, we can, of course, um, be able to do so even, uh, even uh, more robustly and, and better next time around when we need to explore something new. And I think this is one of the very exciting things that we see here. I think it's the first time we're actually learning together with the radiologists. So it's not something we're learning from the radiologists, but in fact, we're learning with them. Um, we still have a major question, and that is, are we going to actually be able to affect the clinic, and can we really put this to use? Um, and there are some places in the world, like China, where it seems to be the case where um, a lot of CT images is used, and therefore you would assume that we can definitely uh, contribute there. Um, I want to share with you another location that um, through this um, platform that Logix has, we uh, basically introduced the measure back into some clinics, and this is in Russia. Um, this is um, Dr. Morozov in, in uh, Moscow. Uh, his center is actually responsible for 120 different hospitals in the region, and they, act and they do use um, CTs, many, many CTs. And what you see on the screen here is um, uh, Dr. Morozov looking at the case as well as um, information that's coming from the AI tools. What he's seeing or he can see are these kind of um, representations of what I've shown you, uh, what I showed here um, in our slides. And super interesting to see is the amount of cases that are now being processed um, using the AI tools. And we're talking about um, reaching a point of 5,000. We already had a day that had 5,000 CT scans that were um, basically passing through this um, center and all of them being processed uh, 
uh, with the AI tools providing the visualization and providing the, the measure, the quantitation. So there, so there is a lot of potential. I think we still need to um, explore further and make our systems uh, even more, you know, more robust. Um, we need to, to check uh, with studies that we're currently conducting and, and are aiming to conduct even more um, the clinical relevance in various studies. Um, of course, a um, very interesting thing is to combine the imaging with clinical parameters, and that is um, the way to go. And these are the kind of studies that we need to do, um, and I know um, we'll hear about in the, coming, in the next uh, presentation. Um, what I'm interested in is to start developing predictive models, again, to use all the imaging and the clinical to come up with some uh, predictions and facilitate management of the disease. Uh, one thing that we also explored and we saw that we could do is basically explore the disease even in an unsupervised way if we don't have the experts yet understanding all of the um, manifestations of the disease. We're basically uh, able to take the cases that we see and with clustering we can see um, the non-COVID cases versus mild cases, uh, the more uh, severe cases, and, and basically um, a lot of tools that we can bring to the table, even in, in the exploration. And I'll stop here and thank you very much.